Yeah, I thought somewhat unusually I'll start with a with a small or short story about how kind of I found out about some of the work you're doing. And um, I think that will, yeah, it relates to quite a few different things that I guess we'll be talking about today. So I did my uh, master's at, so I did the dual master's, that's one year at UCO and one year in Paris, and the dual master's in brain and mind sciences. And in each of those cities, you do a master's project. For my master's project at UCO, I worked in Carl Friston's lab, and I worked with Richard uh, Augstulewicz. Yeah, okay. I, I was going to apologize to the Polish people, but then again, <laughs> you, you made the language. <laughs> Don't blame me. <laughs> um, I tried my hardest. Anyway, so Richard, um, he was my supervisor. And then we we had a meeting one day and then, you know, said like, hey, how are you doing? And he's like, oh, good. We just had this. So this was 2000 and maybe 15. Um, and he said, oh, yeah, so we uh, just came from this meeting with these physicists and they told us about this like new MEG system that uh, it's like really small, you, you know, it's the size of a remote control. You can, you don't need to cool it. It's pretty cool. And I mean, at the time I was like, yeah, whatever, because I didn't really know much about MEG. I'd never used it. I studied psychology where, I don't know, MEG seemed a bit distant and we didn't have one at Goldsmiths. But that was the first time I kind of, I guess mm -hmm. I, I heard about that thing. Mm -hmm. And then... Uh, for my second project in in Paris, then I worked at Neurospin with Aaron Schroger. And there I actually work, used simultaneous EEG and MEG. And so then as I was working with MEG, I suddenly realized like, you know, lots of the problems that come along with MEG. And then suddenly this this brief explanation he gave me of the future of MEG seems a lot more interesting than it had um, at the beginning. So... Um, yeah, and it, it seems in general that like a lot of the problems that we had, you're working on solving in various ways. So yeah, I'm looking forward to to talking cool, about all the cool. different stuff you've been up to. Yeah, I don't know whether you actually gave the talk in London or whether it was. I, I, I was Brooks wondering. Or, I, yeah, yeah. where which meeting Rich is talking about? But it was about that time, 2015, when we were just all trying to. It was before we got any money to do the research, so we were trying, inviting people, giving talks ourselves, everything like that. It was. There was a lot of, yeah, it was a really exciting time. I think we had maybe one channel, maybe by then, maybe one channel, but that was it. <laughs> yeah. yeah, so I mean, I guess we'll be talking about MEG, which is what you work on uh, today. Um, I mean, we'll be talking today, you've been working on it for a while. Maybe just to briefly introduce MEG to listeners who aren't quite as familiar, I guess it seems to me always MEG is like it seems like a slightly exotic and less well-known <laughs> cousin of EEG. Yeah, um, yeah, yeah. I guess because it's much more expensive and does something vaguely similar and most places don't have an MEG machine. So maybe can you just yeah briefly outline kind of what is MEG and maybe how does it relate to EEG from a like, scientific perspective? Like what's the differences in what we can measure and practically like why would you use one or the other? Or, yeah. yeah, so that's a good, it's a good place. To, EEG is a very good place to start because... Um, EEG and MEG are measuring the same underlying phenomenon. That's current flow along a neuronal cell body. What EEG measures are the, the currents that go to cancel that primary current flow, the currents that, that reach your scalp. You know, you have current flow in one direction, but you need to cancel it somehow, and you get lots of secondary currents set up that, that form a pattern on your scalp, and you can measure the, the potential difference on your scalp with EEG. And EEG, as you know, is super... Uh, affordable and it's clinically used around the world so it's a fantastic technique and um, and it's been around for like 100 years or so so it's it, and, and it's still going strong the main motivation for MEG is that it's really tricky to, to follow where those secondary currents are going because they, they get diverted by your tissues and your eyeballs and they just go all over the place so with EEG it's it's it can be really tricky to find out exactly what's giving rise to the, the pattern you see on the scalp the nice thing about MEG is that we're not measuring, or the, the majority of the signal we're measuring rather is due to the, the primary current flow, the, the, the flow in the neuronal cell body. And the great thing about the, that is that this current flow in the neuronal cell body creates a magnetic field. And that magnetic field is, is relatively immune to the different conductivities of the head and all these other squishy medium it's going to, squishy media it's going to pass through. And so what you see outside the head when this, this this neural activity is going on, if you'd imagine them both at the same time, you see an EEG pattern on your scalp, but you also see a magnetic field pattern at 90 degrees to that, which is the, the consequence of current flowing down, or effectively current flowing down a wire. It's, um, it's this, this, I think it's the right-hand rule where the current flows this way and the magnetic field goes around the wire. Um, so the great thing, so with MEG, I mean, the, the, the main 
problem with MEG is that the fields we're trying to measure are, you know, something like a hundred millionth of the, the Earth's field that we're sitting in us. They're tiny, tiny fields. Um, so you can't do it on a shoestring. Like in EEG system, you can pick up in, you could probably pick it up on the high street that would work really well. But an MEG system is, is a, you know, is, is a lot more, exp- it, it traditionally been a lot more expensive and part, um, a significant part of that expense is just trying to put yourself into an environment where there's no interfering magnetic fields. Because even a car driving past on the road outside would be a thousand times bigger than what you could ever measure from somebody's brain, for example. So that's that's the challenge. So you basically pay an, an extra million pounds for an MEG system, but you if you can measure what's coming out of out of somebody's head, the, the problem of finding out where it is is much simpler. So you, you, you're paying for that simplicity of, of working out where things are. Yeah, and I guess because of this like additional cost, MEG is pretty rare. I mean, I. I looked it up. There's this why well, I randomly came across this website, MEGUK dot <laughs> UK or something like that. And I think there's ten sites in the entire UK. Or yes, something like that have MEG. and that, they took a long time to come. I mean, I started MEG in the in the 1990s, and uh, for a long time it was just basically one or two sites with MEG. And it was take, you know I think I think Germany, for example, is a lot faster on the uptake with MEG. But again, there's there's not many sites per country, and and that's. You know, that's a shame. And the science hasn't been able to propagate very quickly because it's kind of a, a bit of a, a rich, you know, a rich person's kit. You know, it, it's, you know, you need a lot of cash and a lot of expertise to get one running. But hope, hopefully the OPMs will change that. To yeah, exactly, exactly. I mean, that's yeah, that's yeah. part of why I invited you because okay, I guess the cool. the new generation of MEG sensors seems to, as I say, maintain a lot of the advantages while taking away a lot of the disadvantages. Yeah, exactly, um, yeah. Yeah, but I guess um, I wanted to get to that later. First, I thought I'd um, I want to talk a little bit about a different project you did, which is still within traditional MEG mm-hmm. scanners. Yeah, um, I just wanted to ask about so um, about the the flexible head casts oh, um, right. that yeah, yeah, yeah. you and your team developed. Uh, back to me doing an, uh, my master's project with Aaron Schroger. I'm pre- I'm like ninety nine percent sure that when we when I was there he ordered or someone from your lab helped him make one or something like that because i remember him saying so i mean so the problem with eug i guess you have this cap on right so you can different head sizes and all that kind of stuff accounts for and if you move your head it's not that big of a problem because the electrodes move with you whereas an MEG, you have this fixed uh i don't know what you'd call it exactly a dewa it's called a dewa yeah it's like a big thermos flask yeah dewa yeah, yeah, yeah. Exactly. yeah and you kind of just put your head into it and then you know, I mean, my head is almost too big for it. and <laughs> I have very little space to move. But if you're smaller, then you have quite a lot of sideways space, especially to move. Uh, yeah, so part of that, um, so what, what Aaron then did, he basically said, like, yeah, there's these people, you know, you see how at the MEG group, they're making these head casts, basically, that you can, you make specific for a person to um, reduce the movement, that kind of stuff. So um I'm, I'm it really annoys me that i can't remember this more precisely but i'm pretty sure he got it and then tried it out and we were just like already excited about it but um yeah can you kind of introduce the project and kind of yeah 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 so how it works? I, I think i i think i even remember aaron visiting us actually yeah yeah uh, so so that first of all they didn't start off as flexible head cast it they were solid solid nylon head cast to start off with but as you as you as you say that that one of the one of the issues with MEG is is that you? What well, the great thing about MEG is you don't have to stick any electrodes on. Okay, that's right. brilliant. Yeah. So you just stick somebody's yeah, head in this kind of cylindrical, hollow vessel, and you start measuring their brain activity. And we do have you know coils on their face so that we know where the head is. But we only know where the head is. You know when you account for how difficult it is to put um, a coil at a specific landmark. You know, especially into between operators. It's really difficult to know precisely where that person's brain is with respect to the sensors. And often, for example, what we were doing a lot of, you know, in the in the 90s and the 2000s, we were doing a lot of comparison with fMRI and, you know, other brain imaging pictures. And we'd always see that, like, they didn't match up. The, the MEG and M- fMRI or the MEG and some other hypotheses weren't quite there. So, you know, half a centimeter, centimeter difference. And there, there was always this... This thing that oh that's co-registration error you know that's that's just the error from not knowing where somebody's head is um, and it always it always it still does seem like a big like a bit of a fiddle 
a fiddle factor to me. Uh, and, and it's a shame because, you know, MEG is a direct measure of neuronal activity. And, and it, it should, it should, you know, if we have our model, if we make it the correct model of what's going on in the brain, we should be precise about it. And it just seemed a shame that you've got this fantastic, you know, fantastically sensitive piece of equipment, but it's, you know, but but then you, you lose all the resolution and all your modeling, everything just goes out the window because you let the subject, you give the subject comfort, basically. Um, <laughs> Uh, and it's a bit like imagine trying to look buying a really expensive telescope, but then putting on your bed and trying to look at the stars with it. You know, it's just you lose all that precision. So that's the problem I, I, we saw with MEG. And so we tried to mitigate that by, by forbidding the subject to move their head and effectively building them into the scanner. So we, we built nylon casts that fit my head on the inside, for example, and the and the MEG, the inside of the MEG scanner on the outside. So I went into the MEG scanner like, like a stopper in a bottle, you know, and I couldn't see, you know, it's completely obscured my eyes and, and my ears, everything. I was just in a, like in my head in a cork effectively that went into this system. And, you know, that's brilliant for engineers, but, you know, clearly we couldn't do very much. You know, the, the, the psychologists and other people were a bit, you know, there's the thing, well, you can't see, you can't hear, what's the point of that? And also the trouble with the, 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 the rigid head cast was, was when we first tried it, because it, it's like these things are tricky to build because if you, and this was also when 3D printing was kind of cool. So it was one of the first 3D printers we'd used. But if you build it, you can build it too, you can, you can allow too much, you can build it, um, you can either build, it's either too big to go into the, the MEG scanner or too tight on your head, or it's too loose on your head and too loose in the MEG scanner. So there's a really fine margin of getting it, and so you, you, you're at the level where you, 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 you're almost stuck inside the, once you get in, it's difficult to get you out again sometimes with these solid things. So that was another kind of, you know, concern. Um, yeah, especially if like me, you're at least vaguely claustrophobic. Well, exactly. Yeah, exactly. I mean, yeah, exactly. I mean, the only, yeah, I, I, maybe it's not a thing, but the only good thing I think is you couldn't see anything. So as soon as you put it on, you didn't know you were jammed into a, into a, you know, you just knew you had something around your face. Yeah. Um, but uh, yeah, so that that was the motivation for the the more flexible um, arrangement. And uh, I should say that we did lots we did lots of simulations to try to work out what was what was holding back MEG because everybody kind of tries to, or likes to dismiss MEG as having high temporal resolution but low spatial resolution. And that, I don't really buy that. It's 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 got high temporal resolution, but the spatial resolution is only really limited by how well you can explain the data or model the data. And so that was the. Uh, that was the motivation is try to get rid of this fiddle factor, the code registration, also try to get some really good high quality data. So you could really test whether, you know, or really prove to everybody else that MEG was better than the, the pub talk, if you like. Uh, and, and so that was the motivation for it. And then we went to the flexible headcast to allow more people to sit in it. Uh, and then we were able to do some nice experiments with those flexible headcasts, have more people that, you know, not just me in, in the scanner. Uh, and it was, yeah, very, it was very exciting. Um, but of course, as you say, you know, there's only a certain bunch of people you can get to do this kind of stuff because every, you know, even people that don't realize they're claustrophobic, when you, when you jam them into this scanner, it's quite an intimidating experience. And there's not many, you know, not a huge number of people that can remain calm and focused on the task at hand. Yeah, I mean, that was pretty much the first time I, I realized that when I was in the MEG and I was without the head guards, right? But I mean, I'm also very tall, so I pretty much am the size of whatever you can fit into the <laughs> MEG scanner. See. But yeah. <laughs> yeah, 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 exactly. And that room in Hamburg is not, not a huge room, is it? It's not a huge shielded room there either, is it? So it's, I can see that. Oh, that was all right. Uh, in, in, oh, maybe that wasn't okay. the problem in Brisbane. It was, yeah, it was a sizable room, but okay, you know, okay. Just the kind of like uh, I felt like I'm not sure I can get out of this really without help. <laughs> okay, yeah. So it's not a good, it's not not a good look. I mean, and also the, the other, I mean the the, I mean all the headcasts. I think they were really good. They were really exciting at the time. The main limitation was you could only scan healthy young people, you know, because you had to be limber enough to 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 get yourself into position. We, right. into yeah. position with because of the danger because you're so constrained that we had to do loads of safety and publish load and i spent all my i spent most of my time telling people how dangerous it could be if you didn't follow all the safety instructions because you don't want to you don't want to move the the meg system while somebody's heads inside it basically so uh right so is it because like you're 
your head is stuck. So if you your head stuck, neck, yeah, then, exactly. It's really yeah. you know, it's it's like MEG is great because it's non-invasive, and you know, compared to many other neuroimaging techniques, it's so it's super safe. But 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 the head cast made it dangerous. You know, yeah. I mean, so yeah, the yeah, especially I guess the one in. At Neurospin, you know, you 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 lower you you put the seat to the lowest position, right, and then you kind of pedal people up into. Oh, I see. Okay, the yeah, thing. yeah. I don't know whether all of them do that, but yeah, I could see like if your head's kind of stuck and you pedal incorrectly or something, then. Yeah, yeah, yeah. exactly. Exactly. What we had to do in the end, what we had to do is we had to get the position, get get the get the the, the system, the chair and the 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 MEG system at the right level, so your head would fit in right. Then get the person to put on their head cast, and then get them to squish in themselves. You know, use their own force to push them in. Because just the thought of using those hydraulics to move anything once somebody's head was enclosed was, yeah, was yeah. you know just too too frightening. Uh, maybe just briefly, I guess I'll I'll try and link to like a photo of an MEG for the people who haven't like, oh, yes, seen yeah, one yeah. because I guess this, this might be vaguely confusing now. But I yes, think once you yeah. see it and once you've like sat in one, this will make a lot more sense. But I'll try and find a like nice photo that kind of maybe shows a bit better what it yeah looks like. cool cool, um, cool but yeah but so the um so i think the one that um aaron got was he sent you an mri scan and then you use that to create the uh, a mold of the outline of his head is that still what ended up being the flexible ones or is that still the rigid ones uh so 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 yeah we, we used we used um well i was the only one that ever put on a flexible one i'm sorry a rigid one i think i think the ones that Aaron got, yeah. So we, we we typically do an anatomical scan of the person with an MRI and then take the out the, there the scalp outline. And then also, I mean, later we try. We initially we also did it with optical scanning, which has also worked fine. You know, so uh, just wearing a somebody a subject wearing a swimming cap and then optically scanning the outside of their head that worked okay as well. But with MEG, we often get an MRI, so it was it was it was an easy win just to take the outline of the. the the anatomical but uh, so is that still required because i guess one question that we had kind of around is like how usable is this like okay it might increase the the signal that you the precision of the signal you get from the imaging machine but if every participant needs to have to do an mri first and then you wait until you get the like head cast made for them that kind of stuff then it just makes it very burdensome even more expensive right so is that still like the limiting factor here or yeah i mean i i I, it's not. It's. It's. I, I'd say it's. Now we've got alternative technologies, which we'll talk about later. It's. It's not a very good. It's not. A, not the way to go for the future. I think. Um, I see. But the what it would be good for would be to do study one subject or a small number of subjects over a long period of time, because you, you have to, like you say, you have to invest a huge amount in each person, and so if you had to get them to to learn something or grow old or something like that, you know, then it's worth it. But actually. For a group study, uh, for example, you don't gain a lot because, of course, there's there's a, all the variability then isn't in the MEG signals between the people, you know. Right. So, so you don't gain much by short scans on lots of people. You might as well just not. It doesn't really matter where the head is then. It's, <laughs> okay. it's it's all it's all lost in the individual variability. But but if you're really interested in say what happened when you you know when you amputated one of my fingers and whether my brain would reorganize. Then, then it would be a worthwhile investment, but not not for larger groups. Only, only for you know, very similar to the way they do things in the animal neurophysiology world, where they use one or two animals and show that it it, it works on one and then also on another, basically. Uh, so that would be the way I would use it. Um, if, we, but we we haven't used them again um, for I think for five years now. We've not used them since oh, really? okay. since that since that time. And it was, I think, it, and, and most of it really was, as just as you say, it was hugely burdensome, burdensome, you know, on the the researcher and and the participants, and it also adds a level of danger that is not acceptable um, when you don't need it. When you don't need it, <laughs> well, to say it sounded like such a cool thing uh, when, when yeah, it was made, but it, it's sounding it does sound great, but it's it's you know, I think it's probably also getting old. You realize all the things that can go wrong, you know. You think that all the things that can go wrong. When I was younger, I never realized how many things how, can go wrong. And now I see all the danger. And then actually everything. will, yeah. Yes, exactly, yeah, yeah. Yeah, I mean, I guess, yeah, also, I guess, part of the problems that this solves are also solved with the new system for imaging exactly, anyway. Exactly, exactly, um, exactly. So, but yeah, I guess, and um, before we get to that, I just wanted to mm. ask just briefly kind of like how, yeah, I like to kind of know like how people get into what they do. 
Um, so my kind of, it's not really a theory, but I feel like most of the people I know who do maths developments started off as a physicist or an engineer and then at some point became interested in kind of biological applications of this or something like that. Um, so I don't actually know what you did. I couldn't find like a, a <laughs> right. full CV or something. So I'm curious, like is... Um, yeah, yeah kind so, of what... so you're quite right. I mean, I, I was an electronic engineer. I did electronic engineering in, in York University. But when I, when I left York, I swore I'd never enter a university again or touch a computer again because I was just so... <laughs> Why? Well, I, I don't know. I just really... I, I, had it, I just felt I didn't fit into academia and I didn't... You know, I, I probably didn't pay as much attention as I should have during my degree, probably. But um, it really put me... Well, maybe maybe it was my... Maybe myself, I put myself off engineering, I think, because it was my hobby when I was younger. Then I went to did my university degree and then I just lost interest in it. Uh, and then I had a couple of years where I wasn't, you know, where I was trying to be, you know, trying to live a romantic kind of life, like Cuggleberry Finn kind of thing. And um, you, maybe you don't want to broadcast this in your podcast, but I ended up in, in science completely randomly. I, I I, I was trying to get to America to pick oranges. Um, <laughs> okay. and, um, Why American oranges? Well, I, it was all the Steinbeck kind of stuff, you know, and it was like one of those things that I thought, you know, because I'd been living in France for a couple of years and and then I thought, time to go to America. And then I went back to Wales and spent all my money. And so I thought, I, I need to get to America. And then there was this advert in... And my, 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 my dad was also trying to get me to get a proper career and he said just apply for some stuff and if it doesn't if it doesn't come off then it doesn't matter and I applied for a, a PhD uh, studentship and it said five it said in the in the advert which is a very short advert it said it mentioned five thousand pounds in it it's a studentship and I thought that'll get me to America that'll be that'll be enough um, and that would that happened to be an MEG that just happened to be an MEG because somebody I dropped out of MEG in Aston University. They dropped out. Uh, it was a funded studentship. The person thought there was no future in MEG, and they dropped out of it, and the studentship had just come up. It happened to be the right time for me, and that's how I ended up doing MEG. It was just a, a, you know, a series of happy coincidences, really. Okay, this is this is really interesting. I did not expect this. Um, I really love when when you ask a question that is often answered with, you know, well, I did engineering and then I saw this, like one of this, you know, professors mentioned this and then I got interested <laughs> in this and so I did it. That's often, you know, what the story is, but this is a lot more interesting. Um, if you don't mind, like, what were you doing? I mean, you said you went to France for a few years being well, like, I, romantic. Well, I, I, I was, yeah, yeah, I was trying, I, I was, I thought I could be a writer. I thought I could be a writer. So I had What, a, what kind of writer? Well, I guess a fiction, writer of fiction, I think. I thought I could be. Um, that was my kind of, that's that's how I saw myself, you know, and I, but I was, um, I was, I did various jobs in France, but I, I was, you know, um, caretaker and a night watchman and worked in McDonald's and um, taught English and stuff like that. And I had a little typewriter in my, you know, lovely French, uh, you know, flat, which I tap on and, you know, pointlessly. <laughs> Uh, yeah, and that, that and that's that's and I yeah I had a quite a lovely time, but I never I I thought that would be that was my calling. I thought well I'd just be sitting around, you know, smoking <laughs> cigarettes if I could and typing, you know, you know, typing away. But it never really worked out for me. Did you ever finish anything or like what? Why why did it not work? Did you not finish? Did you did you finish and no one liked it? Or no, I think I just never wrote much. I think I, I used to write. I used to try to discipline myself to write every day and stuff like that. And I used to write lots of little short things, and I sent a couple off to magazines and stuff like that. Um, but they, they did, you know, they got very nice. It was a time when you could send stuff to people and they'd send you a nice rejection letter and stuff. So that was nice, you know, all by post. But yeah, but I think I, I think I would have, you know, if 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 I had if I'd got to America to pick these oranges, you know, then that would have continued this, you know, this kind of quest to just do, you know, just, you know, just uh, well, just be, yeah, just I, I, I don't think I had a very good idea what life was about. I didn't really get the link between earning money and stuff like that, and <laughs> you know, and so I would just go go from overdraft to overdraft, and then I would get a you know rubbishy job to pay that overdraft off, and then. So I it was just, I was trying to live a fantasy life, really. But uh, but but it, I had a nice time, a lovely time. Okay. Did you, uh, 
somehow it seems to me quite the contrast between like this like romantic uh, ideal lifestyle of like you know living freely and doing these things and then also engineering which to me always seems <laughs> yeah, yeah. much more like applied and get like make it work yeah yeah, yeah, than, yeah you know so i mean there's quite a contrast it seems to me right yeah i i can't i can't really resolve it for you but except that i think it is kind of um it, it, there's this well there's 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 creativity in both and maybe the creativity in it in in the engineering solutions that that suits me better it's just that they're, they're very you know they're, they're, you don't have to have a huge imagination you know and 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 you can put your and and they're practical solutions to them basically and i and i'm not you know and and i've realized i'm not a particularly good writer i'm not particularly good at expressing myself but that, that's the nice thing about engineering is you can you can bash something together and it will more or less work, you know, and, and that's and that's satisfying. You know, you can get something done. You can you can fix things, basically. Yeah. But, yeah, you're right. It's it's a contrast between my younger kind of idealistic self and then realizing what you can actually do, you know, in life. Has that experience helped you in your job now? This kind of, I mean, you must have like learned quite a lot of stuff that I guess many people who go the like traditional academic route of basically being in school for most of their life might not have had. Yeah, well, I, I must say, I tell you the one thing I really liked about academia, um, because during my PhD, I spent a lot of time in 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 Moscow, in Russia, you know, working with the, the guy. I, I, I traveled so much. I mean, and that was the best thing about academia for me. That was the, the thing that kept me in academia was the ability just to keep traveling. And, you know, meeting all these people. And it's such a shame now you can't, you know, the traveling is, you know, it's so difficult. But um, it, it, it used to be the thing that really, really excited me to to meet all, to go around the world and to meet all these people. Yeah, and and, and, and meet exciting, lovely people like yourself. You know, it's it's quite a privilege, you know, I, I think. And I think that's the nice thing about academics as well. They're naturally quite an open, you know, an open and straightforward uh, bunch of people. I think it's a nice, you know, it was it was a lovely, and I'm sure it'll get back to being a lovely life, academia. But I think it's just the the lack of travel for young people. I really feel sorry for for you guys that, you know, you can't do as much traveling as we used to do. I mean, because of COVID or because of yeah, because of COVID and because of air miles and things, you know, because of the the pollution, the planet and stuff like that, which we didn't think about at all. Unfortunately, in the in the nineties, you know, just didn't didn't even cross my mind at all but now now i'd feel you know feel bad about it definitely you know and interesting well it's this diversion but interestingly last time i we met uh in eppendorf uh we went out for dinner uh with tobias donna and um guido nolte and and another colleague and tobias was was saying you know i just read this article and it was saying that maybe in in a year or two or in the future flying will be frowned upon and you know people won't be going to academic conferences and I remember thinking, oh, that's just crazy. That, what, what would be the fun in that? And, <laughs> and you know, it came true within a month of him saying it, you know. So it was quite, um, quite, it was quite a quite prophetic kind of conversation. Yeah. But he was, he was right. He was dead right. Yeah. Well, I guess you can still use trains and stuff. I mean, yeah, depending where you want to go, it's, yeah, yeah, yeah. Makes it's it very prohibitive. But at least, I guess within Europe, you can still. It, it's, quite, I think it's, it's really great. Right. And, but it's compounded for us in the UK. It's a bit, compa- it's compounded by the Brexit thing. You know, it's just, it's a bit ice we're a bit a little bit isolated um but it was it, it is fantastic just to get on a train or, or go somewhere agree yeah i mean one one question i um wanted to ask in, in terms of like how you you know got to what you're doing right now is that one thing i found really interesting is that you know i mean i said i couldn't really find much about you like cv or anything but on i guess the ucl page it did say phd Aston university and then it said you worked at Aston university and then at ucl and my, I hope I'm not offending too many people with this, but my initial <laughs> reaction was, what is Aston University? <laughs> and I mean, I'll say this with kind of a caveat in two parts. The first is I didn't really grow up in England, only the first four years of my life, and then my uh, university studies, but not my school years. And secondly, once you cross a border, the fame or reputation of a university basically disappears unless you're oxford cambridge yeah, yeah 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 yeah. apart yeah. from that there's i mean I, i'm still amazed at how many not just people in general or people who went to university but people who actually do psychology or neuroscience don't know what ucl is when i tell them like, oh really it amazes okay. me whether like like in germany right wow whether, like, okay well wow. you see like i don't know what ucl is right and yeah okay just, yeah yeah okay yeah so it's maybe not that surprising that 
many places on the well known. But yeah, I was just curious, like because I didn't check this systematically, but it seems to me that basically everyone at UCL who's English and a professor did their PhD at basically UCL, Oxford or Cambridge. <laughs> yeah, um, <laughs> it's probably you're probably not far wrong. Yeah, uh, yeah. yeah. So I mean, I, I, so I, I'm very. I must say, I I spent a lot of my life in Birmingham, Aston University, um, and I'm so proud to have worked there. But it is a very, you know, it's a small university, and it's it it, it's, it specializes in kind of vocational training. So you know, it trains a lot of chemists and um, engineers, and you know, practical. It's a very practical university, but it's one of the new universities. So I think it was only created in the, you know, in the fifties or something like that. But what was quite what was quite lovely, oh, I think it's quite lovely anyway. We were always the uh, kind of the underdogs, you know. We, we were we, we firstly we were doing MEG, which nobody everybody thought was kind of a waste of time and a waste of money, you know. And secondly, we were in Aston University, so it was you know it was quite kind of nice that nobody had very high expectations of you, yeah. and certainly not anybody <laughs> in any in any of the better universities who, who took a lot longer to take up the technology. Actually, so it was a really nice kind of pioneering spirit. Uh, but what was what was also nice though was. Because we were the only place in the UK that was doing MEG for so long, we everybody used to come to us. So a lot of the people I know from you know all these great universities, they, they all they all came and joined us at Aston to do studies and things like that. And that's how the technology propagated out of Aston to the rest of the country. And that was that was also an amazing time because we had some yeah incredible visitors and and, and you know loads of fun, lo- just loads loads of fun. Really. Yeah, but how did uh, sorry how did Aston then? I mean, I guess they must have had an MEG machine. Or yeah, yeah, yeah. So, like, so it was how all, did like a small university? Yeah, get it's, all thanks, it's all thanks to my super, my old supervisor, who's who's recently passed away, Graham Harding. Um, but he um, he he basically ran a, a neurophysiology clinic at Aston University. So he used to make you know basically um, it was a clinical service uh, for the uh, the NHS used to use for testing people's hearing and vision and. You know, and he used evoked potentials to diagnose different diseases. You know, like MS or or whatever, or or alcohol induced um, visual problems, those kinds of things. So, so it was a it's a proper neurophysiology clinic. And and his idea, was, what what I think what he didn't like about EG was he needed a ref, you know, a reference for everything. You need to put a reference somewhere and everything. And the great what he thought was exciting about MEG was he didn't need a reference. So you could just you'd measure direct measure of neuronal activity with with one sensor and that's how it started we um he got a system for a single channel system that was kept in a in a cupboard with a hole sawn it was a big <laughs> cupboard and there's a hole in it and then you put your head underneath it and then we Very just true. repeated the same experiment and i was i got a slide from my old colleague paul furlong the other day and it basically showed how we, which i remembered uh, people don't believe me when i first went to aston in 1992 They'd use this system to measure an evoked response to, to a visual stimulus, for example. And then we had some machine that would do the averaging, but then we had a, the, the data came up, was output on an oscilloscope. And you turn up the luminance really brightly, and then we get a piece of tracing paper. We trace the evoked <laughs> response from it. And then you'd go with a ruler and pencil, and you'd, take, you'd, you'd measure the amplitude and, and the latency, and you'd write those numbers down. And then you might type them into another computer to make a, a brain map of what had happened at that particular time. So that was the the level of the tech. We had one channel of MEG, you know, and you had to do the experiments 30 times, same experiment 30 times, you get 30 different channel measurements. And then you'd tracing paper, everything, type all the numbers in, you'd get a, a picture, basically. I remember, I think like in primary school, we 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 trace things like, you know, images like against the window. I, I never thought that that would be legitimate scientific. I, I know, I know it was, it was, it's, it's, it's kind of, I mean, it's quite, it's incredible to me that that's what we did. Um, uh, but um, that, that was the state of the, 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 I mean, that was the state of the technologies before the internet and, you know, and, and of course, I mean, uh, I was an engineer and, and 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 I thought I, I did think it was you know I, <laughs> I did think that, but 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 the fact was we had there were so many other technical issues like getting the single channel system to work uh, the, the the recording that that seemed like straight the straightforward bit the, the actual measure you know the recording the measurements was a nice straightforward bit it was actually getting the the single channel system to work so that was where it started and then Graham um, 
he got money uh, from from the U- Europe, I believe, to buy an MEG system. And at the time, the, the Russians had just, it was 90, the 1990s, Gorbachev had just come in and everything had opened up. And he, he got in touch with a, a Russian team who then built us, uh, you know, a Russian Russian 19-channel MEG system. And again, that was, a, that was you know, very affordable uh, because they, they had not had any contact with the West um, up until that point. And we hadn't any contact with, with, with Russia either. And very, super exciting because, you know, and everybody had a, had a wonderful time again. It was... Um, I mean, just for comparison, uh, the the one I think we used in Paris had what two hundred and seventy channels or something. Like that. <laughs> yes, probably. so like yeah. even nineteen is still. <laughs> yeah, but nineteen for us was luxury because that means that nineteen times, you know, we'd have had to do the same experiment nineteen times with the previous, uh, you know, iteration of the things. Um, so, so this this was already quite amazing that we, that, to get that. So, and that that was really innovative actually. So, you know, because Graham got the money together and he found these this amazing group in Moscow to build it for us. So. So that, that, you know, another good few years. And then probably about 10 years later or less, then these, these multi-channel systems came out, came out with over 100 channels, which, which changed everything. But somehow I thought like MEG, I, like I know it's not like, it's, it's, it's a fairly new technology, but somehow I always assumed it existed, like the, the more or less the machines we have today already existed, like in the 90s or something. Oh, well, yeah, well they, they did, no, I mean, the, 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 I think the, 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 the first... I, th- I think that there, there were there were different versions, but the the, um, the first whole head system I think came around the late nineties, may, maybe you know very late nineties. Uh, but up until then, that we had lots of different shapes of systems, including ones which are just like conical or one hanging from the ceiling, or one sit, come, rising up to the floor so you put them on both sides of your head, or you know there were lots of different different interesting arrangements of MEG system. Yeah. Hmm. Um. Do you, I mean, yeah, maybe last question before we get to the OPM stuff. I mean, do you, I mean, it seems like you did a lot of very small scale tinkering then with the kind of MEG systems. I mean, it seems to me that must have been like a big advantage in terms of like really understanding how everything worked about it from the bottom up. Yeah, I I, I mean, I think so. I think, but I think that's also, that's, I, I, re, I begin to realize that's what I enjoy about the science is actually the the tinkering bit. That's the the bit I get the most satisfaction from that there's that you have a relatively small scale, like loads of relatively small scale problems, but, but you can get through them. And, and in the end you have, you have a working system, but yeah, I mean, that was really, for me, I learned so much just from being in, in, in Moscow and the, the super intelligent, super friendly people there who really taught me everything about the system from the, from the squid design right up to the, the cryogenics and everything and it and they'd all come from you know you know they'd all been trained in uh, these special military academies um you know and their find your projects with things like launching sub missiles from submarines and things like that but they, they'd all go in, gone into you know engineering and it was and, they, and they, everybody was excited that we were actually all doing science together so it was really really lovely Okay, so I just said uh, last question, but I have a, a final last question before we uh, change topic. Is uh, so? How did you then? Maybe like when you then moved to UCL to the Phil. I mean, I mean, did they already have an MEG system when you were there? Yes, or? yeah, they, they had. They had. I think they've had one since about two thousand and five. I think in, in the Phil, and uh, yeah, so that was that was really good. And the reason, again, I'm afraid is no. I moved because my wife. My wife. Um, Moved from Birmingham to to London, and I followed her basically, and that's why that's why I went to UCL. You know, I was quite happy. Uh, you know, I'm very happy in UCL, but I was also very happy in Aston. Yeah. I mean, it, but it also sounds in terms of scale. I mean, I imagine. I mean, the Phil was probably one of the. I mean, I guess it's not like the biggest neuroimaging center of the world. <laughs> I mean, I realized when I was in Neurospin that that's crazy in terms of how much <laughs> neuroimaging they have. But I mean, it seems to me being head of MEG at the Phil is a pretty cool title to have yeah I mean. but but i must say i think it's 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 yeah it's very but it's also well when i uh, i must say i was um and i think i still am i'm super nervous being there because full of smart people they're super smart much smarter <laughs> than i am and um it's you know you can what well, i think what's great about it is you're, ne- you're never comfortable because there's always somebody smarter than you in the room you know and uh, so i think it was more anxious, you know, anxiety inducing than, you know, than anything coming, coming to London, actually, for me, just because you realize how, you know, how brilliant, you know, everybody else is that, you know, you know, a bit like, you know, I don't know, going from school to university, you kind of, 
you think you're smart in, in school until you get to university and there's, there's smart, even smarter people and so on. And I think it was just the next level up. Not there aren't brilliant people at Aston, but I think I, I think there were fewer, there were fewer of it. It was a much smaller place, you know, and and we were much more, you know, it was a small, it was a smaller crowd, smaller specialist crowd, whereas UCL neuroscience is huge, you know, as you know. It sounds like you're you're still coming to terms with the fact that you might be one of the brilliant people. <laughs> no, I know, I don't, I don't, no, that's the thing. It I, seems to be a slow process. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Accepting that. But, no, yes. Well, I, I wouldn't. I definitely wouldn't accept it because they're, they're, But I, but I must say, what's good about UCL is it, I think it keeps you in. Or being anywhere, you're surrounded by people who are a bit have got the edge on you. Is it kind of keeps you young? You know, you can't relax. You know, you you've got you. You think you know you've actually got to work a bit harder. And I think, um, but it's it's been really good for me because it it pushes me to you know not not just sit on my hands and but try, try to you know try to keep up with everybody else really yeah okay well i mean it seems like you've managed to do that uh that's my transition now uh with the new MEG systems that you've been one of the as far as i can tell one of the main people involved in it um it seems i mean the way i see it is it's basically your group at uco and uh, matthew brooks's group at nottingham yeah from the outside that's what seems like other two groups really pushing this forward so yeah i mean we've, we've briefly already alluded to it occasionally uh, throughout this conversation uh, but maybe we can talk about it properly now um so i mean one thing is maybe uh we we won't we probably don't have the time and in my case also not really the interest in discussing the physics okay, uh, okay. Is that something i'm uh yeah i mean you'd have to be very basic to explain it to me that's okay um but yeah maybe from a more practical perspective kind of what are these optically pumped MEG systems um, and yeah, I guess easiest is in in contrast to the regular energy system, the squid systems that we've been discussing so far. Yeah, certainly. So, so one thing I haven't I haven't mentioned about the the systems up until now that we've used traditionally is that uh, inside this big uh, thermos flask or, or dewer containing all these channels, um, it, it, it is full of liquid helium because the sensors traditionally have to be super cold, so they've got to be at minus two hundred and seventy, around minus two hundred and seventy degrees centigrade. And so consequently, the, the, these you have to build these scanners with a hole in them, a head-sized hole that's that's a bit too big for everybody because you want most people's heads to fit in it. But the problem with that, of course, is that um, there's two problems. The first problem is it's a bit too big for everybody. The second problem is the magnetic field from your brain falls off with a square of distance. So if you go, if you could get twice as close to the brain, you'd get four times as big a signal, basically. And so what we've wanted for ages and what, uh, you know, what we had with the old single channel MEG systems, at least you could get right up to the scalp. You know, you could put that single channel right onto the scalp or within a centimeter of it, you know, given the liquid helium and everything. Uh, and you can measure nice signals. But with these generic systems that fit your whole head in, uh, especially for younger people or people with small heads, uh, you lose loads of signal. And of course, um, uh, as with most traditional neuroimaging, you have to stay um, really still. Uh, while you're being scanned, and so what what what's been really what was really brilliant is the people that that built the, this atomic this the, these optically pumped magnetometers. They've been around for a long time, and they've been around for about fifty years, probably as long as MEG has. But what changed was was how the cells were manufactured, and that was driven by advances in atomic clock technology. So basically, what you need what you need for for an atomic clock and, and an OPM, so you need a cell of gas, you need a laser, and you need something to measure the laser light up the other side. And put simply, you use the laser to excite the gas, okay? And you, once the gas is super excited, the laser light goes straight through transparently. But if you put a magnetic field across the gas, you get less laser out the other side. Uh, so that's how it works. Uh, but until now, these things are about the size of microwave ovens basically. And then Atomic Clocks came along and the group in NIST with Svenja Knapp and Vishal Shah and Til Sandri in Berlin. And what, what they were able to do is they were able to build um, optically pumped magnetometers that were about the size of, you know, your thumb or, or smaller than that. Uh, and that, that's what the, the change, the huge change was for, for MEG. Firstly, what's brilliant is you, with our old systems, you had to fill in with liquid helium or you have to have very expensive reliquifying processes. And and of course, but with with these systems, they they'll just keep working for as long as long as they work for, 
uh, there's, there's no there's much less maintenance but also importantly because they're small enough you can just actually instead of having to put the person into the system you can then build a system build a system onto the person and that's the brilliant thing about them so you gain all the advantages of getting close to the head and subsequently what we're able to show is you gain those advantages because you can now that now now that now the MEG system doesn't weigh half a ton you can actually people can move with the MEG system on and that's that's a big that's a big um my uh, shift in mentality for neuroimaging i think because we're so used to just getting people to lie in a tube stay still try not to move whatever you do don't move your head is what we tell people um so suddenly uh with with the opms now we can actually start to to study people as they as they're having a conversation as we are moving our heads around which would be completely crazy in traditional neuroimaging that's the biggest thing I think that that's changed in, in my lifetime is just this idea that you might be able to do new imaging with people, people behaving normally. I, is that enough about, is that, does that describe OPM? Yeah, I think that's a good starting yeah. point. Yeah. And I guess, yeah, what I'd like to kind of explore is this kind of what the consequences are of these changes and what it means for um, what you can do with them, what you maybe can't do with them or where maybe the traditional one is more suited and all these yeah. things. Yeah. So, 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 to give you a concrete example, one of the really exciting things is we know that MEG is really good for epilepsy surgery planning. It's, it's a huge advantage to have the MEG. So, uh, so the surgeon knows, for example, which bit of the brain is creating the epileptogenic activity and which bit of the brains are really useful for hand movement or language and so on. And traditionally, that's done with a neuroimaging technique. And MEG is really good at doing that. The the Trouble is that the good thing is it's brilliant for adults, okay, uh, but the, 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 the patient group that stands to benefit the most are young children, and the younger the child, the more they'll benefit from the neurosurgery, okay? But the trouble is the young children are the most difficult ones to, to get to stay still in yeah. a traditional scanner. And so... Oh, and the scanner is... So and the scanner's way too big for them anyway. Exactly, yeah, so you lose loads of sensitivity as well. So that's that's the exciting thing about um clinically exciting thing about MEG is suddenly we, we hope it will it tr in tremendously increase the compliance rate of these younger children so that they, they, they the, the neurosurgical team get the information much earlier in the child's life and they can consequently have the surgery before the child's education starts even possibly or early on in the education rather than later on when, the, when lots of educational opportunities are, are lost. So so that's that's one good concrete clinical example but but I think there are many examples of things that we know very little about, like we know very little about, you know, keeping on the children. We don't really know much about human development. We, we can't do neuroimaging on these two and three year olds who are just learning to, well, probably, let, let's say it again, we, we don't, we, when, when children are starting to learn language or their memories are start to form, they're at, the, they're at toddler age where you just can't pin them down. So we, 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 are, we know very little about the, the neuroimaging of, what's going on at that stage in development which is really exciting but now maybe with the opms we'll be able to unlock that and then later on in life um you know people develop you know dementias movement disorders you know so many issues that, that mean they can't comply with traditional scanners and so so and gate you know gate issues arising from these dementias you know some movement problems um so you mean like, for example, someone with Parkinson's is going to have a hard time lying still? Exactly, or... exactly. And those people with Parkinson's who can scan in the MEG scanner, they probably, you know, it's they're probably not, you know, they're probably not as representative uh, as as other people, you know. And so, so we we can begin to study lots of people who've got either movement disorders or compliance issues or whatever. So it it, it, it I think it brought I think the most. For me, the most neuroscientifically exciting thing is it completely broadens the cohorts of people that that, that we can study. Uh, but also, it it really it's a bit of a mind shift in the sense that we 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 stop maybe we we can stop concentrating on very efficient paradigms that you know because we, we have to keep people still for say ten minutes at a time in traditional neuroimaging and um, and the only and the way. We, and people, a compliant adult can certainly do that. And the way that we do that is we really focus our experiment to get just examine one variable of interest at any one time. And, uh, but it's not particularly natural probing of somebody uh, or, or, or how, what, how they're operating. And, and so maybe now um, we can start to think of doing things in a, you know, 
a less less efficient way, but maybe more natural way in terms of scanning people for longer while they do tasks in in the normal in a normal way, rather than thinking all the time, I must not move my head or or try not to acknowledge that or, or whatever you know whatever they're normally thinking of. Yeah, it's really interesting to me. Also, in I, one of my former guests um, was Matthias Strangel. He um, is first author on a Nature paper that came out like half a year ago, or something where they had. He's at UCLA right now, and they had. I'm assuming epilepsy patients. I can't remember right now, but yeah. So that intracranial recordings, and they recorded basically neural signals whilst the people were actually moving around. Cool. cool. Whereas you know before it was always you you play a video game and you kind of move through the video game world, but they kind of were the first people to actually like get these. I don't. I can't actually remember whether it was like. Was it grid cell like activity? I can't remember actually. Um, but yeah, they were basically trying yeah, to, that's very you know, they, cool. but they could only do it because they had access to this very specific group of patients. And I guess it's really cool the, 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 the potential that you can do this with basically anyone once you have the system running. I mean, maybe not to that precision, of course, but yeah. Yeah, I think that's, that's really exciting. And, and that, I mean, and of course, with, um, with the rodent studies, they, you know, we're probably a bit, we're a bit behind them. They've been doing this with, with <laughs> yeah. implanted things with mice running around for a long time, you know. But, but then the, they need the mice to behave because the mice can't tell them anything, you know. So they need the behavior. Uh, but we're, we're, you know, it's, it's kind, of, kind of closing the gap now in, in the sense we can have humans behaving naturally and also do brain kind of non-invasive brain measurements but get get some idea of what's going on in the brain whilst people are behaving naturally and one question i have um if we can get slightly into the kind of the, the practical difficulties here is about the whole movement because it seems to me that so when when i did eg studies the you know you obviously i mean there people can move because they're wearing the eg cap and so they, they they have this flexibility but you still don't want to move them to move that much because then you get these kind of movement artifacts and the, the thing I usually showed participants as an example is I'd say like, you know, just bite on your teeth right now. And then they bite on their teeth and the entire screen would just go crazy because the, the jaw is such a strong muscle. And yeah, yeah, yeah. So now I'm curious, like if you're moving your entire body around, doesn't that introduce all sorts of problems there? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Well, yeah. I mean, What's... also problems that you can't really then take filter out easily, right? I would imagine. Yeah. So, so, so I think it's, it's really interesting. It's, and it's one of the, differences in between MEG and EG that that's never I've it's it's an empirical difference um but it's difficult to pin down exactly uh exactly what it arises from but but MEG seems to be about 10 times less influenced by muscle than than EG so so part of the reason is clearly EG you need a reference uh, and so that if if the signal gets onto your if this muscle signal is on your reference channel or signal channel then it then it tends to go everywhere part of the reason is is the as i say the meg sensitivity profile is very well defined so in the in the source level images if you like the muscle anything happening in the muscle localizes to the muscle but also something i read the other day which i thought rang true was was the other thing is is that the meg signal falls off very quickly with distance you know and if you think about the EEG, the EEG electrodes are pinned onto the, you know, they're effectively stuck on the muscle. Whereas the, the MEG sensors, even, even the OPMs are, you know, six or eight millimeters away. So if it's two versus eight millimeters, for example, that's a fact, that's four. But that's the 16 times smaller signal that you might expect from the muscle in the so MEG. Does the EEG not have the, just the, the exponential fall off with distance or? EG, yeah it does it does have it but it's like the, the electrodes are actually stuck on you know they're stuck okay, there on okay, the muscle yeah yeah yeah, yeah. Um, but of course we, we have other mystery we've plenty of other mystery with with the MEG the, the art we, we still see artifacts and we still see muscle artifacts um, they're just possible they're, they're on they're more focally distributed over a smaller number of sensors yeah and they do cause lots of problems they it do cause us lots of problems but the the, the main source of our main source of artifacts due to movement are actually due to simply the movement of the sensors within the static field, basically. And that, although, although that's really destructive, it's very simple. It's very simple to model. So we know what the fields are around the person and we, we can watch the head movements. We know exactly what the fields should be for a particular head position. So we can, we can correct for that. But the, but the EEG side of it, it's the physiological it's like like you say it's the physiological artifacts that that really constrain you it's the muscles and they're much more difficult to model to to explain where 
where all those currents are flowing from, and, and that's why it's tricky. That's why it's tricky. We also do get problems with our, with our leads in the imagery as well. It's, it's the, the wires seem to be a problem whichever domain you're in. You know. <laughs> yeah, I mean, I was going to ask about the the room as kind of the next question because it seems to me that when Amy, you know, as you said, like the signal you're measuring is tiny compared to all the other magnetic stuff that's going on uh, all the time anyway. So you need like these specially shielded rooms within which you can record this. So it seems to me that that kind of slightly mitigates part of the advantage of the new system because one of the advantages is you, you don't have to have this huge machine anymore, but you still have to have a huge room. I mean, the room still has to be the same, right? So Yeah, um, you're still in a metal box. Yeah, you're right. You're, you're quite right. So... Yeah, you're, you're you're absolutely right. So first of all, you know, the the, the room is quite. I mean, our room is, is three by four meters. So we're in central London. That's you know that's that's a good sized room. So <laughs> yeah. so you can. And the, the great thing about that room is there's nothing else in that's there. That's a studio it's, apartment. Yeah, exactly. Yeah, there's nothing else in there. So there's no there's no lumbering piece of equipment in the middle. It's just you're just sitting there with the the helmet on, and that's it. So so you could you could you could fit a lot of you could fit other people in there or or you know. Probably about the size. It's probably um, a table tennis table. You could just about fit in there, probably. I imagine something like that. So, so the room. But you're quite right. I mean, what the the main barrier to entry for this technology is is this lumbering shielded room that the people have to sit in. That that that's very expensive. It's about half a million pounds. Oh, really? Okay. Definitely. And what we would like, what definitely, what one thing we pla- we would like to do in the future is to get rid of that room. We just we'd like to get rid of it, and we think it's possible, and that's basically two factors. the The, fir- the first thing is we think that the um, the, the well the, the great thing is that the, the OPM sensors themselves have become about ten to a hundred times more resilient to magnetic noise since we started. So, so for example, our um, system at the moment we have to stay within about two nanoteslas of zero. I've not mentioned this, but the OPMs have to work in a zero field environment, so they're a bit even fussier than than squid systems as to how they will operate. But uh, basically, we've gone from two nanoteslas to now sensors are available today that have a closed loop bandwidth of two hundred nanoteslas, so you can get a lot more data into the OPMs themselves. And of course, the other good thing is is that with, with our colleagues in Nottingham, we've experimented a lot with with shield trying to shield the the Earth's Field or mitigate the effects of the US field to some degree. And so we think that maybe maybe it might be possible to build a room like a normal room, a relatively normal room that, that's got some low level, low level shielding in it that, that that would allow OPMs to operate in the real world, which would be which would be the next step. It seems to me if you want to do my my kind of intuitive guess here would be that you know, the, the the larger the room is, exponentially more you can do within it, but also exponentially more expensive it gets to shield it. <laughs> I don't know whether that's quite right, but yeah, it's 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 yeah, it comes down to the cur- yeah. So what's good is the you're right. The larger the room is, well, probably the more expensive it is to shield it. Yeah, but the the good thing is you. It, it turns out with the you know you're basically building Helmholtz or Maxwell cores, but basically the larger the room is, the the more space you have in the middle of the room to play with. And probably the less precise you need to be with building these big coils, you know. So if you had really big coils, maybe, maybe, maybe I'm saying that incorrectly, but basically big coils, larger space, bigger coils, larger space, you're free to move in the middle of the room. But you either then you need more current in the coil. So ecologically, you know, you, you're burning up electricity or, or you need to do more turns, just have more, more wind turnings on your coils. And so, so, and that's more work, but that, that's, that's definitely the way we'd like to go is just to try to try to get these systems to work and shield, you know, at least semi shielded w- without the expense of the shielded room. One thing to point out, of course, is that people have already made measurements without any shielding at all with these devices in, um, in America, in the woods in America from the, I think, Romales lab. And basically they, 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 they've built a magnetometer that, that me- they've measured auditory vote responses in the woods without any shielding at all. So, so it, it is possible. It is the future, but there's you know there's certain even on that design there's certain constraints that that we'll have to kind of work around basically. <laughs> It'd be great. Now you just see neuroscientists with their participants in the middle of the woods now everywhere doing their science yeah. rather than in a city. 
It's it's funny because because um, I was talking about um, I, I was talking to one of the conferences, one of our uh, Biomag MEG conferences. I was talking to one of the the first one of the pioneers of MEG in um, in North America, <clears throat> and I think he was based in Halifax. I, I'm sorry, I've forgotten his name now, but um, but he said that because they used to do all their measurement before shielded rooms. Everybody used to go to the woods, you know. In Finland, they go to the woods, and in but in in North America. Uh, That's and, why there's so many Finnish MEG yeah, yeah, scientists. Probably. I always wondered why. Yeah. It seems so random. Yeah. But in the um, in North America, the main constraint, because I was talking about the constraints on recording for us. I can't remember why. But um, but the main constraints for them was were the mosquitoes. It was how long you could bear the mosquitoes <laughs> for in the woods. And that, that was what yeah. their recording time was limited by. But basically, we're going back to where we started, you know, 50 years ago, going back to the woods uh, to try to get these devices working again. Okay. I mean, is it on the horizon that, you know, in 10 years, we'll be able to have one of these wearable energy systems and kind of be just walking through a house and record? Or is that well, I, science fiction? I, I, well, I'd like it to be. I mean, I, th I think you've got, to, you've, got to, you've got to dream big, haven't you? And I think that's where we'd want the technology to be. I think already you could probably build a system like that. You could probably build it. But it would only measure the half of your head that was pointing due north. That would be the only thing at the moment. So as long as you you're doing lots of rotations of the you know of that space, you know that that you could you could, you could make up for that under sampling. Um, but I think that that would be the aspiration, you know, because I think you know coming back to EEG, that you know the big shoes to fill. And what's brilliant about EEG is it can go all around the world in any hospital, any clinic, and it just works. And I think that that would be the way that, that, that if, the, if the technology is going to take off and get cheaper, then it has to it has to show some clear benefits over that, really. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Um, brief question about the kind of practical aspects of getting a machine and financing it. From what I understand, this is quite a lot cheaper than the yeah, 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 yeah. machines. But you know, when I, I think when you gave the talk in Hamburg, I think you said that you kind of can't buy one. It's not like, you know, you, you go to a company and you just buy a machine. You kind of have to build it yourself or something like that. So I'm just curious whether you can comment on like, what is the, yeah, like how do you get a machine? How do you get one of those systems and how much does it cost? Yeah. So actually, yeah, I remember that. And um, since since that talk now, there, there are now two commercial companies that sell OPM systems. Oh, really? Okay. Yeah, yeah. And one of them is Circa. That's in, that's Svenja Knapp. And she was one of the original, um, you know, the person that, effectively built the first you know went from atomic clocks to opm so that one of the first sensors and there's another system which is uh, called circa that's based in the uk which is our nottingham collaborators and magnetic shields which build build the rooms and uh, and they sell the the, the uh, a system that's put together using sensors made by one of svenia's former colleagues Vishal shah who, who, builds, who builds opms as well in america and so so there are two companies now that that will sell you an OPM system. I think even with shielding, um, I can't tell you. I don't know how much they cost. I've not not looked into it, but I can tell you that that roughly the and to buy um, a two or three channel OPM device, you know, that's about the size of your thumb at the moment, it costs about five thousand pounds, something like that. You need a uh, you need at least 50, say you need at least a hundred channels around the head, basically. So you'd need at least fifty of these. Device, probably 50 of these thumb sized devices. So, a quarter of so a that's million. 50 times 5,000. So that's a quarter of a million. Yeah. And then, then you need a shielded room. So the shielded room, unfortunately, that's expensive, kind of built from expensive alloys. That's a bit more expensive. But again, a uh, young epilepsy with these colleagues I mentioned, uh, magnetic shields and Nottingham University, we put together a, a shielded room that, that uses about 40% of the expensive alloy. So it's a cheaper room already, uh, but it's got more active shielding in it, you know, constructed by, by Niall and Richard at, at Nottingham. And, and that's, that's absolutely brilliant. So, so I think things are, things are moving away from the, you want to move away from the expensive alloy to get the room costs down and ideally to go to no alloy at all. And that'd be brilliant. But the OPMs themselves, Going back to the atomic clock analogy, analogy atomic clocks also, also used to be about five thousand pounds each, and now they're less than hundred dollars each. So that and that's because they're useful, you know. There's there's a market for them, and so if the OPM technology were to take off, then then hopefully the price of the individual sensors have come down. They'd be a lot more affordable, um, and of course it's already more affordable technology than squid technology because you, you know you don't have to pay for all the 
the helium and all that that those that expense yeah all the maintenance so, of yeah all the maintenance yeah exactly um uh so you know so it's 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 definitely it's definitely getting there but who knows which way things will go but what's also really exciting is now oh you know i should mention there's also a french company mag4 health that makes helium based magnetometers now and i think there's a finnish or elector based consortium that's also building magnetometers so there there are at least two two places two or three places in europe that are building uh, opm systems so actually from and that's quite a change because i was in hamburg as you say in 2018 2019 so yeah, I started in 2019, so it must have there been we go. After yeah. That, yeah, so in the last yeah le- less than three years, there there are you know, there are quite a few companies on the scene that are selling that this this gear. I mean, that's yeah, that's really cool because I remember like asking that question then, and it was kind of it seemed like this slight disappointment with like it's kind of cool, but like you kind of have to be like an engineer and build them yourself. Uh, but that's yeah, it's great that that's happened so quickly. <laughs> yeah, I'm kind of disappointed. I mean, it's nice. It's it's kind of nice when it's all in you know. When you have to fiddle with it, you know, it's, <laughs> once it all gets turnkey and stuff like that, it's um, you know, it, it loses some allure. But it, but it, it <laughs> well, for some people, yeah. yes, but not for. But obviously, it's completely useless when it when it's not working. So I can completely see why 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 every, you know you want a turnkey system definitely. Yeah, um, I had a question. Wait, yeah, I forgot what it was. Um, yeah, maybe okay. So maybe then as a kind of, I oh, say, this was the question I remember. Is the analysis the same? Like, can you use the same tools that you use for the squid MEG? Or do you have to like, you know, you have to basically create a whole new toolbox for analyzing OPM? No, fortunately, the analysis is is almost identical to the to the squid, squid level analysis. The, the only... The, the only additional analyses are, are getting rid of all the, the external noise, basically. So, so you have to put... Um, you have to put a couple of uh, noise reduction steps before you get to the traditional squid analyses. But yeah, fortunately, we use the same, it's basically the same soft, it's the same algorithms even for EG when you get right down to the bottom level. Um, but it's the same. It's So that, that's really good. And so, I mean, that's very positive for the community. I think it, the, the, these, once once you've got, you're familiar with the MEG or EG, then, then you, you'd be able to use OPMs without any any problems at all. Yeah, that was kind of my slight concern there. That basically, like all the, uh, not like obviously all of it, but that you have to, yeah, just rebuild the whole analysis machine. But oh no, fortunately not. not. Fortunately not. I mean, the only the only tricky thing is now now we're actually with the newer sensors, we're measuring three directions at once, and we were, we were only used to measuring just one direction, which <clears throat> we got used to reading the the maps of brain activity. You know, feel going out, feel going in, but now you've got feel going in three directions and. It's very difficult to get your head around us. So we, we may convert it all back to the old style pictures <clears throat> just to make it interpretable, you know. Yeah, I don't know how, how easy this question is to answer per se, but I was curious just as a kind of maybe summary of this entire discussion about the OPM MEG system is kind of like what kind of studies is this yeah, particularly well suited for and what is it less well suited for? I mean, you already mentioned different populations uh, like children or people with who, for whatever reason, can't get into an MEG scanner. Are are these two systems of MEG good at measuring different things, or do they fundamentally measure the same thing exactly? And what does, would that mean for like study design? Not just study design, but yeah, for like what kind of questions you can try to answer with them? Yeah, yeah, yeah. So I, th- I think I, I guess at the moment the at the moment the major distinction is is that. Is the amount of time you have to spend per subject, probably. So, so in a traditional MEG system, you can you can do you know you could probably you could you get through eight you know if you're pushing it you get through eight subjects a day almost in one experiment, and you put every subject you put in the gear would work beautifully and you'd, you'd get something out of that subject just because the systems have now been around for over twenty years and and they work really well, and and you have three hundred channels of data already there. So for the for the OPM systems, it's still a bit. It can still be a bit flaky, you know. And so you still spend a, a fair amount of time getting the things working once the subject has arrived. Uh, and of course, at the moment, we're building um, we're building helmets for them, you know, for each individual subject. In the same way we used to build the the head cast, we 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 take their MRI or the optical scan, we build it. So that take that's another additional step you do per subject. Do you have to do that? Like with EG, you don't do it, right? You have 
like three size caps or something. Yeah, you don't have to do it, and hopefully we won't have to do it in the future. And the main reason for doing it is the is the miserable wires again. You know, there's well, there's two reasons. The first reason is if you've got the sensors held down, you know where they are, you know exactly where they are with respect to the brain, and so it makes it makes the noise cancellation and the source reconstruction a lot more straightforward. Uh, the second, uh, more practical reason is it just holds the sensors still, so they can't wobble independently of one another. Because if one's wobbling to the left and one's wobbling to the right, you, you can't really correct for that that noise. If they're both wobbling together, you can correct for it. And the the, the other reason is is that the the wires coming off the sensors they they interact to some degree. In the schematics, it looks great when you've got like a hundred channels on your head. It's just got a hundred dots, you know. <laughs> but when you when you put the wires yeah. on, it's a real mess. And all the wires tend to interact with each other, and you can even hear them. You know, you're moving your head around freely, but you can also you feel not only some resistance, but you can also hear the wires, rest, you know, rustling with each other, uh, and that also creates some electromagnetic noise. So, essentially, building building a bespoke helmet just mitigates all of those problems. But what we would hope is that in the future, you know, when the basically when we know more about the sensors we'll be able to work out where they are individually and we'll be able to mitigate these noise problems better. But at the moment, we're at this level where it's just easier to know everything about the sensors than where they are. It's almost, just, I'd say, it's probably essential that we get this sorted out for the future. In, in young epilepsy, this this is um, in Surrey. They're, they're a clinical site that have, that have adopted OPM technology for, for pediatric epilepsy. And what they have there, and it's the Circa um, solution, is they've got three different size, like you would for EG, you've got three different size helmets. And before the child arrives, they put the helmet into one of three different sizes of helmets. And so that's really good. You, you still have this issue that the helmet's slightly a bit too big for the, the child, but it makes a lot of sense practically. You know, then you, you, can, you can get, once the, once the child arrives, you can scan them very quickly. And we have we have a <clears throat> kind of a policy at our center that, that we, we're not allowed, you know, you're not... We try to discourage people from doing OPM scanning if they could possibly do it on the, the traditional MEG system, just because it generally will be better. If you if you're not if you if you don't want somebody to move their head, if you don't need somebody to move their head, then it will be better on the traditional MEG system. Even though you do lose the sensitivity to some degree, you kind of win because you can get more subjects through 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 right. the gear. You know, see, so win on statistical power, and you win on you know time per subject as well, probably. Clearly, that will change. You know, that will change in the future as the OPMs get you know better and faster and easier to use. But at the moment, it's basically it's the OPMs are, are best suited, a bit like the headcast. They're best suited for you know small numbers of people where you're going to keep doing the same thing over and over again, or you know, or watch the brain changing over time, for example. Yeah, but it's as you said, like that seems more like a current problem rather than a in principle problem with the system. Yeah, yeah, exactly. Yeah, I mean. <clears throat> I mean, the exciting things about the OPMs, is, as you pointed out, is what you can't do with, with normal images, you can't put the sensors anywhere except where they are. You're stuck with the sensors all around the head. And that's a great thing about the OPMs is now we can start to, to experiment measuring, you know, down the spinal cord or or wherever. And so that that's really exciting. Or, for example, around the face area, you know, to access these frontal structures better, maybe. And we, we haven't been able to do that with, with traditional MEG. So, so you've, you've got the flexibility of the OPMs, but with that flexibility comes a lot of, you know, a, a lot of trial and error, trying trying to get it to work. Yeah, uh, but that was a good transition to the next uh, paper of yours or project I want to talk about, which is the mouth MEG. Oh yes, um, yeah, yeah, yeah. So yeah. I found that really fascinating. I mean, again, I saw this the first time when when I attended your talk in Hamburg, and I went through this like brief period where I was. I just started wondering about like how you might improve neuroimaging. And I always <laughs> wondered like why no one with EEG or something. I mean, this is probably like a very it's probably a very good physical explanation for this. But like why did no one put like electrodes like in someone's nose or in the mouth or in the ears? It was like something to get like you know, to, to not just have the, the surface of the scalp, but to get it from the other direction. But oh, but, but they I, do. They, they do. Oh, they, they do? do? Okay, but at least I, I hadn't heard of it. It's it's mostly uh, clinical, but it's, I think it's called splenoidal electrodes and they stick them in your just it just they stick them i think it's somewhere around here they stick them and it goes right, right into your temporal lobe basically okay yes uh, but but it's of course it's kind of a clinical thing and it's so i think it's mostly for, for epilepsy i mean it's not something you do on your your undergraduate students or anything like that you know it doesn't it's a big needle you know effect oh so it's actually like a uh, it's not on the surface you insert it into the skin. yeah yeah uh, yeah, okay, yeah, okay, yeah 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 so it's not 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 as 
it makes our you know what we did seem quite you know quite quite yeah nice but i mean really. so the for what i understand the math MEG is a system where you basically take i don't know one or multiple i'm not sure of the regular census and you just let someone bite on them <laughs> yeah exactly i mean what so what <laughs> this this is so the, the the sensors are now about the size of a Lego brick or the size of my thumb, but um, they used to be uh, much bigger, about the size of a marker pen. I haven't got um, a marker pen, but they used to be about this long. Yeah, and so that, that's how that's how it ended up in my mouth. We can only put one in my mouth because that was the only num- that was the maximum <laughs> yeah. number you can get into a mouth, basically, of those sensors. Now the sensors are a lot smaller, uh, and every so often somebody does say we should put more into your mouth. You know, the reason we did that, and we were lucky, we. Were, a few happy coincidences there. We were working with a dentist, and um, Andrew Levy, and so he was able to build us a, um, a, a kind of a dental prosthesis for, for myself that had a had a sensor slot in it. So we were able to, it was something fit to my upper jaw, and then the sensor slot into that, and the sensor touched the you know exactly <clears throat> the roof of my mouth. So that was one good thing. That was one good thing. And the other lucky thing was we were working with um, Eleanor McGuire and Daniel Barry, and they had a really nice paradigm for uh, for exciting the, the hip, engaging the hippocampus. And so, it, so we were able to kind of test whether that sensor gave us a bit more information. And it's really unusually placed for MEG, as as you know. You know, you, you can never do that with a with a traditional system. Um, and what was quite incredible, it, it, it turned out that the roof of the mouth was a really was a really good place to put it. You know. Um, you know, I think we, I can't remember whether we did the experiment first or the simulations first, but then we didn't think a lot. We didn't think very de- in much detail about it before we did it, put it like that. But it turned out that um, the, the signals generated by the hippocampi, they create maxima that, that one is on the temporal lobe and the other one is is on the roof of your mouth on each side, basically. And so for, we were very, you know, I think it was partly luck as well that, that we happened to get the sensor in the right place. But that's, I think that's exciting because if, if you had uh, epilepsy and, 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 and the, the alternative, you know, it was, was invasive surgery, then although it wasn't very comfortable putting the sensor in my mouth, you know, it, it's definitely a lot, lot better than kind of any kind of surgery um, and, you know, minimally, minimally invasive, you know. And, and, we, and like you say, we could fit a lot more sensors in now with the current design. Yeah, do you... Um... I mean, this is a general question I wanted to talk about briefly is kind of like how well are you able to uh, measure neural activity from deeper brain regions with MEG and how much does adding this sensor you know, <laughs> on the other side of the brain basically relative to the on your scalp how much does that help help that here yeah well I, I, two good questions uh, so all I can tell you was that the sensor in the roof of the mouth explained a lot more variance, in experimental variance, than any sensors we put on the scalp. So I can't give you a localization answer, but I can tell you it definitely helped in, in terms. So it was picking up very relevant signal from these deep brain structures. So it's very important. But the, 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 the spatial resolution question is always a difficult one for, one for MEG because it, it kind of depends on how much data you've got and how many sensors you've got. But what it what it looks like from many well, uh, not from many, but from other studies, is that the we're, we're very comf- we're very confident in lo- lo- localizing structures like the hippocampus, anterior versus posterior, left versus right, that kind of thing. But um, what the trickier structures are stuff that that are right in the middle, the brainstem, for example, things like that. Uh, but even that has been measured with MEG. But but coming back to the EEG example. The auditory brain stem response is done on toddlers with an EEG system that costs about twenty pounds, probably, without any problem every day in every hospital in the world, you know, and that's no problem at all. Whereas the MEG effort was was huge, and that was that was the Finnish guys, Lowry, Parkon, and colleagues. So the the, the MEG localization of very deep things is, is definitely trickier. But the, the nice thing about the MEG over the EEG is 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 that you're eight, the EEG guys know where where the auditory they know that the response they get is from the auditory brain stem because it's very got a very characteristic latency and they've they've built up that data through lesion models over the years. So they know exactly which part of the pathway the signal is coming from. But if you were to see that signal with MEG, you'd also be able to localize where it was in the brain. That would be the thing. So with, with EEG, it might be di- more difficult to say exactly where it was, but with the MEG, you'd be able to say precisely where it was. Uh, so the, we're getting less signal from the deeper brain 
but the great thing is with these new sensors is we can have a lot of them and we can also record for a long time, which is a luxury we've never had before. And this is where we were trying to get to bring this back to the headcasts. We were saying what happened, what, what point would MEG break? You know, when can you break MEG? How, how long would you have to record for in it in order for this thing to stop improving? You know, and what, what's the obstacle? What's the barrier? And I think we still, with OPMs now, we can really kind of explore that. We, because theoretically, the longer we record for, the the source localization, our models, everything should just keep getting, well, everything should keep keep, keep getting better as long as our modeling assumptions are correct. Okay. And what, we, what we'd like to do is to, to hit that point where we think, oh, no, it's not getting better. We need to change something. And then we know what to change. But up until now, we've never really got, you know, we've never been able to get enough data to really see that, that transition. Or we've said, oh, it's car registration error or it's something else. But having the OPM to me, we actually really can push the system to, to challenge how we model these current, this current flow in the head. So that'd be kind of cool, I think. But for a cool from an engineering point of view, not from anybody else's point of view. Yeah, but I mean, if it, if it leads to us being able to find out more stuff with MEG than we could before, then I mean, yeah, yeah. It, it, I mean, it's it's still it's still very exciting, definitely. Yeah, yeah. Um, maybe as a kind of last point, uh, I wanted to ask kind of more broadly about how methods development and basic science kind of interact, and how you know developments and methods often allow you to. I mean, they're kind of a necessary condition often to find out interesting new stuff. I mean, some of the you know grand examples from science might be something like um, I think Galileo had his some of his discoveries briefly after. I think he actually what did he made his own telescopes? I'm not sure, <laughs> but he had like a new telescope that no one else had or something like that. Um, or from from neuroscience, I don't think it's a coincidence that uh, John O'Keefe found play cells a, f a few years after it was first possible to record from moving rats um who that can just move freely around in a certain area now i mean so the 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 opm meg is maybe not quite as much of a step because it's still meg but it's i think it's still a significant step it's a big step with what you can do with meg uh so yeah i was just curious first yeah kind of the two related question like how you think about <laughs> methods development and then also what you think maybe can what some of the basic questions that can be answered using this new technology that maybe couldn't have been answered otherwise yeah yeah wow that's a big one but i i, I so i for me for me I, I i mean well i'm really lucky i work in a place where there's loads of cognitive neuroscientists and loads of clinicians who were always asking questions and kind of pushing the technology so it's very difficult to say you know what what comes first because i i you know often feel like oh well we should you know people say can we do that why can't we do that you know why why is that not possible and and uh, you know just thinking of the um you know a lot of the the motivation for opms that, that came from ellen mcguire and her group who were saying well you know we we can't really study um memory because we've got no vestibular stuff or we've got no you know that it's it's not it's it's not a realistic kind of situation And it's likewise with the children with epilepsy that we'd have to study those because kids are moving too much. So often, um, uh, so uh, the reason, uh, let's put it this way, the, maybe one of the reasons we got the funding to do the OPM stuff in the first place was because there was a really good scientific or clinical motivation for it. But I, I basically, I'd be, I'd be out of a job if it wasn't for the cognitive neuroscientists and, and the clinicians thinking about, you know, brilliant things to do with the gear, then I wouldn't have a place in this world, you know, because that, you know, It's it's that it's that interaction, that exchange that, that, that they say these are the these are the important questions. This is what we don't know, and that's what that's why it's interesting. I think if probably if you're brilliant like Galileo, then you can build the gear and ask the science, ask the right questions as well. But I've always I, I've always felt like I can just about keep my you know clinging on by fingernails here. I can just about keep control of the the engineering methodological sides of it, but I have to leave the, the neuroscience innovation to, to the professionals really. But I, I must say, I, I think, yeah, I, I'm really excited by how the, the two things uh, intertwine. And I think that's also kind of the measure often of a really kind of, or the kind of neuroscientist or clinician we like to often like to work with. They're the kind of people who just say, well, you know, we know it's a bit, a bit risky and it's a bit tricky and we know it's not going to work first time, but this is what we'd really like to study. This is the 
this is the question and and, and it's the question that 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 drives most of the stuff um it's, it's it's answering those particular questions that i could not frame uh given my knowledge of the brain and my family is always appalled with how little I know about the actual brain itself. You know, <laughs> yeah. they always look at me when something's on the radio and I'm just saying, I don't know where that is even, you know, in the brain. So, yeah. it's, uh, so, so I think, I think, uh, yeah, I, I think, I think it's a really good symbiosis. And I think I, hopefully it will, it will always continue like this. The kind of geeky people that enjoy the methods also hang around with the geeky people that enjoy the, the science, I think. Yeah. It's funny that you, the way you framed it in terms of like, yeah, I mean, the, the basic scientists asking researchers to, you know, why can't we do this or can we do that or whatever, because I interviewed uh, Chris Frith a few months ago and he, he he basically said like one of his jobs was was getting Carl Friston to do stuff like, <laughs> but like not to do stuff but like like to do the impossible like I really want this to happen can you can you make it work please oh that's nice that's really yeah, nice so, it's nice that's that really tradition is, is continuing <laughs> yeah. that's really nice oh that's lovely